Good evening. I'm Marissa Levine, director of Inforum at the Commonwealth Club, and welcome to Designing Your Life with Bill Burnett and Dave Evans. Nice to see a full house. Now, if you didn't already know, Bill's the executive director of the design program at Stanford, where Dave is an adjunct lecturer in the product design program. They've both worked at companies from Apple to Electronic Arts, and today they co-teach the insanely popular Designing Your Life course at Stanford. And now with their brand new book of the same name, you don't even have to go to Stanford to get access to Bill and Dave anymore. No tuition required. They are here to help us build a well-lived and joyful life through design thinking principles. And our moderator for tonight is Suzanne Gibbs Howard, a partner at IDEO and the founder and dean of IDEO U, where I hear they also know a thing or two about design. So now you never know who you're gonna meet at Inforum. Uh, take a moment and just say a very quick hello, hello to the person sitting next to you. And that's the perfect amount of friendship for now. You will have much more time to talk later, I promise. But it's more fun if you know who you're sitting next to. Speaking of having fun at the Commonwealth Club, there is a ton coming up. So just a few things on the horizon. A great LGBTQ rights panel featuring Rick Welts, president of the Warriors, on the 29th. Conservative podcaster Ben Shapiro on April 24th. And there are about 50 tickets left to see Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant on May 4th. There are actually going to be two programs here from the Commonwealth Club next month, Krista Tippett on April 18th and the former president of Mexico, Vicente Fox, on April 19th. Now, to do everything that we do here, we're a nonprofit. It takes members, donors, supporters, volunteers, friends, and, as it turns out, some donations. We are in the middle of a matching donation sprint now until March 31st. If you happen to have some change, dollar bills, we like checks too, there's a box out front. Please feel free to make us a donation and a great anonymous donor will be matching it for the rest of the month. We are going to take live questions from you at the end of tonight. So when you hear the warning, start thinking and staff members will be out in the audience with microphones. Questions end with question marks. Don't include personal life stories. We do include, we encourage live tweeting here, so ringers off but phones on, or sorry, ringers off but tweets on, there we go. Uh, we like the hashtag InforMSF, all of the handles for everybody participating tonight are up behind me. Please take a moment to locate the exits nearest you, you'll see the exit signs, the closest one might be behind you, I love feeling like a stewardess. We are also sold out tonight, so we are live streaming on Facebook. Feel free to share the post for your friends who missed out because they didn't get them fast enough. Finally, these excellent books will be signed by Bill and Dave after the program. Do us a favor. Stay seated when the program ends. I'll come back up and we'll direct you so that you don't have to stand in line. You can just stay seated and talk to your new friends. And now, it is my pleasure to welcome Bill Burnett, Dave Evans, and Suzanne Gibbs Howard from, to the Inforum stage. Thank you. Who's here? Oh, I'm sorry, in the middle. That must be yours. Thank you. It's my personal copy. I've read it cover to cover. It is excellent. Um, thank you. I'm thrilled tonight to welcome Bill and Dave here to the Inforum series and to share a bit of their story with you. I think I've been incredibly impressed. Just got to see them run one of their workshops upstairs earlier tonight, and it was fantastic. So um, I'm curious to start off, as I know many people in the audience are very excited about the world of design, about the world of design thinking, and passionate about the change this can make in the world. I'm curious to know how you started to get the idea of applying design to people's lives. Mm -hmm. Well, I just really sucked at figuring out what to do. Um, so when I was 19 and a college sophomore, you know, I was really bad at answering the question, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And, and then I went to the grown-ups, and the grown-ups sucked at it too, as it turns out. And I, I found, you know, um, the university and other places that looked like they were supposed to be helpful sort of criminally negligent. They kept saying, well, what do you want to do? I go, yeah, what do I want to do? Exactly, that's the question. They go, yeah, that's the question. I go, no, it's my question. They go, no, it's my question. I go, wait. How do we do this? They go, when you figure out what you want, you'll let us know and we'll help you get it. I go, well, that, getting it, that's easy. 
Knowing what you want, that's hard. Uh, and that wasn't very helpful. So that's where it began. Uh, Bill was better at being a college student than I was, but you know, so it really started with my own journey and finding this stuff out. And then, you know, in Silicon Valley in the early days, everybody's trying, is this what I really want to do? Is this really it? Is this meaningful to me? You know, it turns out most people think, most of you probably think your life's fairly interesting. Is that what you, you know? And, uh, and the, the, they don't come with a manual. Yeah. Um, Bill, I'm curious with you, did you ever feel like your life was taking a wrong turn and you needed to course correct from it? Well, I, you know, um, I had a different experience. I, I was sort of clueless, but intuitively found the things that made sense to me. I grew up, um, I grew up in the Boston area. I grew up outside of Boston in Burlington, Massachusetts. And the day before the, uh, uh, you, know, you had to apply to colleges, I hand wrote an application to Stanford and somehow or other got in and chose it because it was as far away from my parents as I could get. I, that's it. I did no research on the university. I didn't know they had a design program, nothing. I thought I'd be a physicist. But I also liked art, and I liked I liked science, but I liked art, and I liked people in psychology, but I liked engineering. And so I didn't know what I was going to be. And I, um, I had this crazy idea. I would invent my own major. I'd be the first art, psychology, and engineering major. And I ran up, I ran up, I remember running upstairs to the School of Engineering officers on the third floor in the quad in those days to Kay Bradley, who ran the whole thing. And I said, she said, what are you so excited about? I said, I'm going to declare my own major, art, engineering, and psychology. And she said, oh, you don't have to do that. That's called product design. <laughs> Go down the hall. There's this guy named Bob McKim. <laughs> and so I literally just discovered that I was in the right place accidentally. But then I, but that was, that was everything because that, you know, that then, then I got a job in design, designing toys, and then I got a job, you know, at Apple, designing, you know, amazing Apple things. So it was, it was, an, it was, took a long time before I figured out what I was actually doing, because I didn't even know there was a thing called a designer. Nobody told me that, you know, when I was little. Yeah. I mean, I think people still think design is some kind of magical art form, and you have to be, you have to have the special talent or something. But that's not at all the way I experienced it. It was just like you just work hard and you figure stuff out. And it's so interesting to put all these different pieces together. So, you know, um, but then, then I ended up back at Stanford and I'm running the program that I graduated from. And my students are in the same place. They're really confused. They don't, you know, just saying you want to be a designer. Well, what kind? You want to be a graphic designer, a UI designer, UX designer? You want to design things, digital things, physical things. So Dave was over at Berkeley and um, teaching a class over there for kind of in the same area about, about helping people find. Finding your vocation, finding your path. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, he, and, he, and I had just gotten this, uh, David Kelly, who's an amazing guy, had offered me this opportunity to work at Stanford full time. And so Dave came over and he said, hey, listen, do you think the designers are having trouble kind of figuring out what they want to you know, figure out launching. I said, yeah, they're all having trouble. I have office hours over and over again with these kids. And he said, well, maybe we could apply, you know, design to this. And I said, let's do it. And the real reason was because um, having been at Stanford in the Emmy department and working with designers for many years at Apple and Electronic Arts and other places, I knew they were the lunatic fringe and pretty open-minded. <laughs> and, you know, Stanford is a hard place to crack. And I thought, and then I heard Bill, who I knew from business before, had gotten this new job. I go, well, you know, I can't get in the front door, but there's now an unlocked bathroom window in the design group, you know? And, <laughs> and you know, I'm large, but I could get in if they gave me some time. And so I, I had lunch with Bill one day and said, you know, there's this crazy idea, you know, and I thought a year later we might think of something. And he said, great, let's do it. We'll start in the fall. We'll prototype it this summer. I need a proposal on Monday. Well, I was curious how you started the class. Did you just launch into the full thing? No. Or did you start no, no, off no, with no, small no, seminars? No. Or how did you we, prototype? We prototyped it. We got, we, so, we, 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 so Bill says, we have to prototype this. Fine, no problem. So we called up eight former students students, I think it was three former undergrads and three former grad students who'd gotten design degrees, and said, hey, come on over and have a conversation. And for two Wednesday nights between 8 and 10 p.m., we ran, I think, six exercises, none of which we used anymore. They all sucked. Um, <laughs> but, um, and at yeah. the end of the second night, we had this kind of dramatic encounter where this young man goes, no, we're not leaving, when we said it's time to go. He goes, no, we're not leaving. We thought, oh, well, we thought we, we, thought we were because we thought we were in charge. We're done. Um, we don't have any more yeah. exercises. And, then he, yeah. and he goes, no, we have no place to have this conversation. And we actually heard that phrase over and over again, the place to have this conversation, this place we're having this conversation, you know, is something that society sort of lost track of. So we just started, you know, with the best ideas we had, and we went from there. And, and you know, my, my old mentor, Matt Conn at Stanford, said you use design to design. So we prototyped, I mean, there's... 
in the 10-week class, it's two hours, it's 20 hours of stuff. There's probably six or eight exercises in each class. It's not a lecture. It's a very interactive thing. And so that's eight times 20, right? Um, we've prototyped every single one of those things a dozen times. And we change it. We meet an hour before class to schedule the whole thing and make sure we're all ready for the event. And then at, we spend an hour after class saying, how did that work? Did it connect with the students? It's a huge pain in the butt. Could we, <laughs> could we make it better? So it's a really, I mean, when you get into this designer mindset of like you're going to prototype everything, everything, is, everything can be improved. It's, just um, it's, it's, it's exciting because it's a really cool way to teach a class. Mm -hmm. With the, now I know a lot of you, <coughs> some of you have read the book. Some of you are hoping that you come to this and then you don't have to read the book. <laughs> and um, so I thought maybe what I'd ask you to do, it won't be as good as the entire book, but maybe you can give us like a overview two-minute overview of kind of the major ideas in the book. Okay, so we actually, one of the, you know, we, we, we Bill often says, you know, we, we didn't intend to, and we, we haven't written a self-help book. We wrote a book that people hopefully find helpful for themselves, but it's not self-help. Um, and uh, I thought it was a design book. Yeah, that's you know, this big word on the front, you know, yeah. um, but, but nonetheless, we, because we launched the book, the we got put on AM, TV, you know, drive time, you know, morning shows. And they said, no, we, the, the one minute interview. And they said, no, we have to, we have to have one sentence. We have to have the one sentence. They get, no, we eschew the one sentence hypersimplification okay, so of a complex only have one human minute life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just getting started. And, and so we said, okay, the one sentence is, if you want one sentence, it is, get curious, talk to people, try stuff. And we can actually do two out of three in the next five minutes. So Bill, why get curious? One of the mindsets of design is curiosity. If you want to come up with something new, you can't start with being skeptical or rational. You have to say, well, this has never been done before, so well, let's go out in the world and be curious and talk to people. Um, so this whole idea of getting curious is about, well, I'm, wherever I am in my life, it's fine. We, we, there's a big sign over the studio at, at Stanford, the, the design loft, and it says, you are here. And it's, uh, we just put it there to make sure the students understand that it doesn't matter where you're starting from. Just start from where you are. And if you get curious, what's available? What, what, what are you curious about? What would, yeah. be interesting to, what would be interesting to try? And what could you actually do? So that's mm -hmm. the curious part. So, so what you're curious, so, and then if, you, if you're curious, then the first thing you could do really easily is this thing I haven't done, this thing I'm, I'm interested in learning more about. Well, there are people who do that, and I could maybe have a conversation with people who do it, and that's actually a prototype experience of their lives. Not a research thing like, what do you make, and what degree do you need, but just like, what's it like to be you, Suzanne? I mean, that's, you, know, you do a very different thing with this. I do, you, you, tell me the story. So if I get the story, that's really an encounter. So right now, you all got homework, okay? So we're going to do homework in the class. So right now, I want everyone to think up of a single topic that if you knew you could sit down and have a cup of coffee with 30 minutes with somebody who really knew a lot about this thing, whether it's a personal interest like Asian fusion cooking, what does that even mean? What is, how do Asians fuse? I don't even understand what that means. Um, <laughs> or, or, or kite surfing, or yeah, and, you know, nanotechnology commercialization, what's that really going to be? Or is there a place in big data for me? Some question that you're actually curious about, that if I could promise you you could have coffee with a cool person who would tell you what that's like, You'd so sign up for that, okay? So and I want everybody to think up that question. I believe you have been given a piece of paper, a little piece of paper and a pen. A pen and a index card? Battery-free technologies we thought what? you could use. What is deep learning anyway? Yeah, you know, so if, write down that. So write down I that topic. I thought I was learning, that's, but maybe it's not. Okay, write down that topic. So everybody's <laughs> got to have something you'd be willing to have a coffee about if you had an expert in, across from you, okay? And this is like the real deal. You're actually curious. And then where and, and so and where do these encounters come from, people? I mean, how do we get them, Bill? How do we how do we get these conversations? You talk to people. And you talk to you, people, and yeah. that comes. But I don't from, know them. Well, then you're going to have to network. Have to network. Yes. Oh, it's the networking. Well, I love one of the things yeah, you talk okay. about in the book. While people are thinking about their question, are, are these dysfunctional beliefs? And yes. you talk about networking as a dirty word. Yeah, yep. it's a dirty and word. people have really bad vibes toward networking. It's and so how do, you, how do you reframe networking for people to make You're it? You're just asking directions. And by the way, this is almost universal. Even when I present to the MBAs, the incoming 400 MBAs at the Stanford School of Business, like they love networking, not like two of them. You know, because you're using people. We're just using people for selfish, ill-gotten gain. You know, well, the reframe is, no, 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 you're not at all. You're just asking for help. You're asking directions, right? So how many of you ever given directions to somebody, you know, where you live, San Francisco? Anybody ever give directions to a stranger? Who's Keep directions? your hand up if you did it more than once. Okay, you repeat offenders, right? Okay, <laughs> so when you give directions to people, say, a stranger walks up, 
says, I don't, I don't know how to find Marine Memorial. Oh, hey, you know, go, you know, and you, and, and you stop what you're doing. This person you don't know from, it could be a serial rapist, you have no idea, you know, you don't vet them carefully. You know, you give them information you carefully crafted and curated after years of studying Google Maps yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then typically, if you, you know, like most people, they, 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 what do they do after you give the directions? They just, they, they, yeah, they, look, they just leave, right? You know, they leave. Anybody get a $5 bill, a bottle of wine, anything? Get anything out of this? You know, and typically after you do this, how do you feel? Feel good. Okay. So you got used and you feel good about it. Okay, and then so you do it again, and you do it again. <laughs> so that's called being human. We call it being human. Humans like being helpful, and you've never been in, we just wrote a book, never, we were never in Authorville before, so we went and met some of the townsfolk, authors and agents, and, and agents we had conversations authors, with people yeah. like that, you know? We I'd know never what. been in educator town before, and I hung out at Berkeley for a while and talked to people who did that. So the locals will be just as nice to you in the domain of human existence called a field of interest, as they are geographically. So that's all we're trying to do. Nice. So if we've got everyone has a question now, there's right. something that they want to learn about. Right. And since we, as designers, have a bias toward action, yep. mm. how are we going to do Okay, so everybody in your this? feet, everybody stand up. Well, we, we will too. Now, we are now going to announce that everybody gets to use each other for the next two minutes <laughs> by being nice and helpful. So. Without relocating, within the four feet around you, say hello. Do you know anybody who knows anything about Asian well, fusion cooking? Well, whatever's on and your if card. they do, say, this would you be willing chance. to give me their name or can I contact you and write their email or their name down? <laughs> real questions from real people, go. You can actually find somebody who can help you find that conversation. <laughs> okay. You do the debrief. I just turn my mic on, okay? And it always gets really loud, really fast. Yeah. <laughs> the team member I want you to meet is that young lady right there in the gray suit. I'll give her directions. Okay. <laughs> Myself. Okay, and stop! All right. Stop All right, talking! <laughs> stop having such a good time! Stop. Cut it out! Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> no, stay, you can stay All right, standing. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, you can sit down. Sit good down. Good job. Have a seat. <laughs> there you go. All right. I have a question. See, those strangers are willing to talk. Sit down. <laughs> this always happens. Okay. See, really, really interesting people come to the Commonwealth Okay. Club. Okay, we'll right. bring the lights back right. down, We have please. to ask a question. Yeah, quick question. <laughs> who didn't get an answer? Who didn't, who struck out? Nobody yeah, who, knew anything about my Who asked around, got skunk, got nothing. Okay. Could you tell us what it was? Competitive what? kite flying. She's interested in competitive kite flying, like two-string kite flying. Anybody in the building know anything about serious kite flying or kite competition? One, two, One, three, two, three, four. Oh. four, four five, 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 six. Six Who else? competitive kite flyers. Who else, Who else got skunked? Got, got I skunked. did not get any help. Yeah? Can you Where? tell us what it is? Well, you, you can't you volunteer want? someone else. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> An building, expert, compo building, library, building, components, libraries. For UI, UX, component oh, libraries. Oh, software component libraries. Who, okay, who so knows how anything about UI, UX, component libraries, UI, UX, software. software, component libraries, got one, one. I got two, two. three. Four. Okay, back so, in the room, check it out. One more. Who gets got? What? Would you, no? You yes? Oh, all right. Uh, you who else has one where they didn't get any answer? Yes, sir. Two people want to learn about component libraries. What's that? How to, How build to build a home shipping from a shipping container. container. Homes. Okay, so container or, based or modular home construction. Uh, one, about two, three, four, one, five, right back there. Two, three, four. Okay. Now, we, once, we once had a person say, I want to know somebody who does surgery on a air, Navy aircraft. ship. Yeah. And, aircraft and carrier the person surgeons. whose daughter was the flight surgeon on the Enterprise was sitting right next to him. Now, what did we just demonstrate to you? 
The, the little interrogation we just did with the people who got skunked, what did we just show you? We're in, <laughs> in, San, We're Francisco. in San Francisco. <laughs> and somebody I knows... appreciate that local pride, but I hate to tell you, this works everywhere. You need to keep asking, and if you do, what are you going to find? You're going to get help. We've never, ever, ever done this. I once was asked to do this with a group of 12 sixth grade boys from a private school in Tokyo. In a culture where they don't confront strangers, they're 12, they don't know anybody. <laughs> I knew I would finally fail. They did great. You know why? There's this thing called the internet. They've met people. So it always works, but you can get help. You just have to ask. ask. Okay, Lovely. so that's a little demonstration. So, you just did some design. Curious. Nice job, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. So now, now everybody has a contact, and what's the next step? What do you suggest that they do? How do they start to, do stuff. to prototype? Okay, prototype. So, I mean, I, one of the things I love is the language you use. You talk about prototyping as sneaking up. Sneaking on up the on the future. Yeah. It's, it's a, time a lovely machine. way, yeah. Yeah, so prototypes are time machines. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really curious about competitive kite flying. I run into these three people, and they say, I know, I, I do it, or I know a friend who does it. So the next piece is. Let's have a little prototype. Now, you can, there's two kinds of prototypes in our life design model. One's a prototype conversation, one's a prototype experience. Uh, going and talking to a competitive kite flyer and finding out, like, how did you get into the sport and where do you do it and where are the competitions? That's an opportunity Can you get to, hurt? It's, it's a little time travel experience, right? They're already you in the future you're interested in. They're a competitive kite flyer. You've never been one. If you have a conversation with them, People will call this sometimes an, just an information interview. But it's not really an interview, because it, it's not the data you want. It's, no. it's their experience. You want their story. And it always works, because you have something in common with that person. You think their story is very interesting. You don't know anything about competitive kite flying. And guess what? They think their story is really <laughs> interesting, too. <laughs> have you ever met anybody who doesn't want to tell you? Have shared interest. You're cool. I think you're cool. We get along. Yeah, you think you're cool. I think you're cool. So that's the first thing. So that's the do stuff. You can do a prototype conversation, and then you can have an experience. So if, back to kite flying. So I could <laughs> actually go to a kite competition. I could go, oh, hey, do you need somebody to help set up a little? I mean, find little tiny ways to go actually do the thing. We worked with a woman who actually didn't do this at all and completely built, you know, dropped her executive career, went into the, you know, her final, followed her passion, went all in, didn't lean in, fell over, you know, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and bought the farm and succeeded and hated it. Oh, my God. You know, uh, it turns out running a restaurant is not anything like thinking about having one. And how about a little catering? How about maybe work as a waitress for a while and actually see what it's like on the other side of that swinging door and what they do back there, you know, because you're not a sous chef yet. There are lots of ways you could actually test drive before you buy the car. Uh, and very often, and some of the meta narrative in the culture right now, which, which loves extreme and commitment and are you going for it and just set the bar high and clear. We think that's a terrible idea. Set the bar low and clear it easily, then just do it again and again and again and again and again. You know, we like succeeding, you know, or trying things that are actually doable. And so the whole idea of these experiences is just ways to actually go out and do a thing in some little kind of a way. You'll be surprised at how real it actually is. Because as Bill loves to say, you know, you're not a brain on a transport system. You are an embodied intelligence and you need to take your entire personal self into situations and see what all of you learns. Wonderful. And I'm curious, now that this is really exploding, you've got an online course, you've got a book out there in yep. the last few months. So how is the scaling and what's the diversity of kinds of people that you're starting to see pick up this methodology and apply it to their lives? Well, you know, that, that, you know, again, I, I thought we were writing a design book, and design's an interesting topic, but it's turning up people. Um, so um, our... Our social media person, she's here somewhere, Savannah Peterson, who's amazing. Yeah. Um, she's tracking. Very shy young woman shy, right yeah. there, ladies and gentlemen. She's, she's tracking right. like 300 or 350 book clubs. We call them design teams because we say in the book, it's hard to do this by yourself. Get a team together and, you know, do the exercises. The exercises are very simple. You can do all of them in 15 minutes or something uh, in, in each chapter. Um, so that, and so these, these teams are getting together, and they're reporting in, and we're doing Facebook Lives and stuff with them. That's kind of open office hours. Um, there's, we just had a group up in Canada post a, a video of their book club, you know, conversation, conversations yeah. and stuff. I just got an email from 
um, somebody who did the Creative Life class, and he and his wife did it, did it together, and they're co-designing their Odyssey plans, which is one of the big things in the, in the book where you come up with three versions of your they're life. Out, so. and, they're, and they're prototyping things together. Um, that's amazing. We just got a, I just got another email from a guy up in um, Northern California who works in a, in a, um, a university that's for the disabled. And he's using this as a curriculum, and he's going through it with the people in his class who are, you know, have a various a variety of different disabilities, and, and they're finding it useful. So um, we try people working to, with um, vets coming back with PTSD, people working with people recently out of incarceration, people right. working with you know small kids or, or, or with junior hires and senior hires. So one thing we really hoped um, was that, because we keep getting asked the question, we describe what do we do? Well, we teach that class to help you figure out what you want to be and you grow up, or the way we'd rather reframe that, grow into next as you continue growing. Um, people go, ooh, can I take the class? We go, oh, no, you can't. <laughs> um, you know, because apparently only 16,000 people on the planet matter, and they're the ones on the Stanford campus. So we got tired of saying no. Um, there are seven billion people, and that's kind of crummy. So we um, finally decided, Bill actually made me write the book. I didn't want to do it. He didn't um, want to do it. <laughs> I successfully resisted for two years, and I finally lost the bet, uh, and we wrote the book, and hoped that what it would do is create a platform that other people um, who serve constituencies we don't have access to could do things with. And the early feedback, you know, just in six months' time, you know, with many, many people around the world is, is so far so good. And when you're, when you're seeing different people, say you're seeing some vets with PTSD, right. or I've heard even homeless people, right. or uh, people with disabilities picking it up, how, what are some of the ways that you're seeing the process mm -hmm. shift? or some of the nuances of how you're recommending people move forward? Or is it the same approach, no matter who you are, no matter what well, your constraints? I mean, your, your, search, your situation drives a certain set of questions, right? Um, when, we're, when we're working with college-age kids, they're not thinking about marriage and life and balance and that kind of stuff. When we're working with mid-career people, that's the big question. How do I make the career work with my life and kids and everything else? When we're working with encore career people, people are in their you know, 50s and they're thinking, you know, I've had a good career, but I'd like to, I'd like to move from the money-making side of my life to the meaning-making side. Um, everybody has a different set of questions. All, the, all the, the processes work the same. You still prototype stuff. You still you know, get curious. You come up with three plans. You try things. You talk to people. Um, but, 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 but the degrees of freedom are different. And, you know, yeah, sure, if, if you're a vet with PTSD and you're just trying to get through the day, then what you're going to prototype are really simple, small engagements and trying to get some mastery on that. Um, you know, I mentioned David Kelly, who's a fantastic guy. I worked with at Stanford, and he started the D-School. He started IDEO, among other things. Um, he wrote a book called Creative Confidence, which is all about this idea of guided mastery. Like, everybody can be, everyone in this room is as creative as everybody else. But some of you got labeled Oh, you're not creative. You're 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 smart, or you're the accounting person, or you're something. And creativity was labeled art artist, and you're not an artist. But it's just not true. What we know about the brain and creativity is everybody has the exact same capacity for creativity. It's a it's a matter of practicing it and learning it. And so, you know, if you're if you're a vet, you're gonna your, your guided mastery path will be to just get yourself to the place where you can mm -hmm. make bigger plans. If you're in the middle of a job change, your plan will be, you know, how do I navigate all these choices? Or how do I generate some choices so I have something to navigate? Yeah. The tools are the same, but the questions are really different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, we let, and we let people come up with their own questions. There's nothing, Dave likes to say, we don't should on people. There's no should in the book. You should do this, you should do that. It's just, here's some tools. You, you can read the book out of order. It's kind of fun if you read it from the beginning to the end, because there's some cute stories in there about, about friends of ours. But um, you, you know, it's just use the tools that work for you in whatever stage your life is in and whatever, right. whatever challenges you're facing. And if they, if, they, if they work, you're in great shape. Yeah. If they don't, pick a different tool. I know one of the things that you were sharing upstairs in the workshop was yeah. about the fact that, I mean, so many of us, we're very fortunate. We live in the Bay Area. Um, the Lots economy is yeah. yep. fairly good. Sure. Um, and so for a lot of people, it's about smaller changes that they're trying to make. Right. I think for a lot of people, especially in the inform and Commonwealth community, it's about current events, political action, these kinds of things, and making room for different kinds of behaviors. I thought it was interesting you were sharing some exercises that are not about overhauling your life, right. but about little small shifts that you can make to make things better. And I'm curious about some of the ways that you're using the process to help people tune their life. Uh, to the exercise that we talk, because it's if you're really going to think like a designer, which is sort of a way of being in the world, 
You're, you're leaning into this curiosity, we call it curating your curiosity, you know, and then taking action on it in small ways. What that gives you an opportunity to do is little stuff. And most of the people we work with, even who take the, the all-day workshop or the 10-week you know, course at Stanford, don't do some massive shift. I mean, it's easy to read the title of the book and think it's about massively redesigning your life. That's what it really means. Like, we're going to go, you know, jump out of the plane and do something really different. Uh, and if you're doing that, the, the tools are great. But nonetheless, um, we're all living our lives and we're living into the thing we've never done before called the future and becoming an ongoing one of the many versions of our authentic selves we'd like to discover, right? Um, so there are incremental steps we can do. And even thinking big gives us chances to move small. We really do like the small moves thing. You know, and that gives us a chance for lots of people to try lots of small things. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of this stuff has been around for a long time. Um, but the Positive Psych guys have talked about, you know, noticing when you're grateful. If you spend a little bit of time at the end of every day and you write down what was you grateful for, wow, you will experience your life uh, as being more meaningful. So we have a gratefulness journal, which is very straightforward. And, and, you, and you look at your energy and your engagement. What did you have energy for today? What did you engage in? You know, um, I, I love neuroscience, so here's a little quick factoid. Normally, you run your body on about 2,000 calories a day. We eat about 2,000 calories. And um, your brain's 3% of your body weight, so you'd think your brain would take about 3% of the calories. It takes 25%, 500 calories to run your brain. Your brain is the most energy-intensive thing on, in your body. So that means all of the energy that you spend attending to things is where you're engaged. If you manage that engagement towards things that are positive or things that are generative or things that um, you know, kind of feed you and, and teach you, you will experience your life differently. Yeah. You know? And it's not, it's not like, oh, mm -hmm. just positive thinking and everything will be great. It's, not, well, you know, it's hard to do positive thinking lately. Um, <laughs> But I was thinking, are you, have you seen a change in the last few months with the kinds of challenges the world? people are yeah. coming to you with? Yeah, I left the house and everything. Yeah, no, the, um, well, the, uh, one of the things I like about the work we do is, um, look, we, we live in a very cognitively driven society. Uh, Dave's personal opinion. And we also live in a society that's astonishingly engineering driven. You know, the, since the, before the Industrial Revolution, science and engineering and technology has made a tremendous amount of change. But it's come with a certain way of thinking in the world, engineering thinking. So this five sense quantitative form of knowing where I can know the right answer. Am I really doing the right thing? Am I really doing the right thing? What if there is no such thing as the right thing? Am I really doing a worthwhile thing and I'll find out maybe never if it really was the right thing? The singularity thinking is not helpful. And so we think it's about what do you think? So we get cognitive, we get ideated, we get ideologically minded. You know, in, in a design, we don't analyze to think, we don't solve to think, we build to think, or we draw to think. So let's say I want to go work on a social problem. You know, gee, can I, can I work with those people? Wrong question. What's the work? Let's go do it. So let's, let's, let's prototype what we could do in our neighborhood to change what's happening with the kids and recycling and what's going on with the food distribution problem. And I don't really care what you think. Let's come up with an action plan of something we can do, go have the shared experience of having an impact in the world together or learn what we did wrong together. You know, and I, don't, I do not need to know who you voted for to do that or why you thought that. And so if we could sort of get over this understand everything before you do stuff, you know, how about we do the lab, we get the lecture later, you know, practice before theory. A little more of that, we might make some, some more progress. Well, I'm curious why you think that way of being, there's people are in a moment in the world where they're very attracted to the idea of taking action, of feeling their way forward, mm -hmm. of not following pre-described paths. And I'm wondering what you think is happening in education in this moment right. and and maybe in the larger social world that's helping people want to take this path forward a little more than they might have in the past. I mean, the, the explosion of entrepreneurship is an example of that. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, um, you know, because uh, you know, I, want to, I want to take action um, you know, educationally. When, when we, yeah, in education, when we first, when we, after we did the first couple of prototypes of the class, we went and we talked to a bunch of smart educators because we, you know, we're, there's people on campus who've been teaching for a long time. And, um, one of our really, really wonderful friends, Jim Adams, who's also a, a brilliant designer and, and instructor, said, you can't teach this stuff. It you can't work. teach meaning, it won't work. Uh, and, and then um, the, the head of religious studies said, oh, you can't teach meaning on this campus because they're going to run you out Once of here Once they figure out what rail. you're doing, you're going to get <laughs> yeah. fired. You're going to get fired. I mean, you know, we don't talk about meaning. We just fill the kids full of facts, and they got to go figure out what to do with it. 
And what we've noticed is that has changed dramatically. In the last five or, or seven years, there's a lot more conversation about what is college for? What are students getting out of it? Is the liberal education still viable? You know, why are we here? What are we learning? Mm -hmm. And this, and it's also the generation that's here now in the last five years is demanding to know what is college for, and um, and we're just and, and and so surprisingly, people are starting to go, oh, you guys have an, you guys have a way to talk about that without telling, without shooting on people yeah, saying, well, I mean, college can, is for this. Can or you substantially impact these questions without sneaking in your version of the answer? Right. And so now, what the academy has long committed itself to in the post-enlightenment era is we will not abuse the power of our teacher position by telling you the answer. We won't even allow ourselves to sneakily you know, slide it in between the lines when you're not looking. So we'll back way the heck off. Yeah. You know, first, do no harm. Well, eventually do so no harm, you're now doing harm another way. And so one thing we found is, yes, you can develop constructs that are powerful and helpful without being either inappropriately proscriptive or prescriptive. The one of the nicest things we heard in a book review, which is actually about the audiobook, was the, uh, the reviewer said, clearly the writers respect the autonomy of the reader. And we went, yes. Yeah. You know, because because you're in charge. There's and, nothing wrong with you. And just on education, real quick, um, yeah, yeah. we're going to run a workshop for 16 universities in June to take this class and spread it out from, you know, Dominguez Hills Community College to Harvard and Yale. Um, and they're all saying, yeah, our students really do want to have this conversation. And, um, and we kind of like the way you guys frame it, because again, design is this really open, very neutral, you know, we're not saying it's about God or whatever, it, we're just saying, hey, you can design this thing, and the thing has meaning if you, if you subscribe to that, and you can pick any meaning system you want. The only thing about design is it's inherently optimistic. Nobody designs anything to make it worse. I've been on a lot of design teams. <laughs> right. Sometimes we accidentally did that, <laughs> um, um, but that wasn't our intention. We were trying to make it we, better. This is just too hard. We shouldn't really yeah. waste our so time. But it's such you know, a great can... add to university yeah. curriculum right. to yeah. have something that is about connecting all the things we're learning to yeah. the reality. We call it latent place. wonderfulness. That you, look, you, you, you just make the bet yeah. that there's latent wonderfulness out there, and you're going to go get it. And if, if you actually assume that it's true, your chance of discovering it goes way up. And if it turns out you're wrong, like, oh, OK. Shame on me. I was yeah. wrong. It was boring. Okay. So, okay. you know. So now I'm really wondering, both okay. of you have kids, right? Many. Yes. yes. Um, how old are your kids? Uh, 26, 25, 22. Okay. 29 to 35, and the grandkids are 1 to 4. So the whole time you were coming up with these methods, were you prototyping on your own children? <laughs> <laughs> we called it practicing. No, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> parenting. Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No, parenting is a great lab to demonstrate your finitude. Yeah. But I, but I am curious when you're, um, uh, as I was reading the book, my husband, who's also here tonight, I made him do yeah. all the exercises with yeah. me. And it was great because I wanted somebody to talk to. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm curious to know if you're engaging other people willingly or mm. less than willingly. <laughs> yeah. what, are, what are some of the yeah. no-nos and yes-yeses well, about one, how to one of the things What not to do? Yeah, one yeah. of the things that... that uh, Could you help me design we, my son's life? Yeah, we were at a workshop. Uh, we were doing a workshop my in London. My husband Lon couldn't come, but I'm taking notes for him. Right. We were doing a workshop in, in London, and there was this family of a oh, yeah. really pissed off teenager <laughs> sitting here like this, Four. and another really pissed off 22-year-old sitting there, and their father in the middle. And we're like, okay, Very this, this isn't going to work. And we actually went over and tried to break them up and take the kids away and say, your dad really loves you. He's just doing it the wrong way. Um, you can't make somebody else design their life. Right. Um, you can, um, one of the things that's cool is a lot of people are saying, hey, I got the book and, you know, I liked it. And then, you know, I bought one for my friend because she's in the middle of this job transition. Or I bought one for... You know, my niece, because she's in high school and she's getting really freaked out about college. And, you know, I thought this might be helpful. So if it's helpful, it works. But you can't. You know, and, and you saw in our design process, you know, there's a we have a process diagram because we're a university. You have to have one. And it says, you know, um, you know, uh, empathy, define, ideate, prototype, test. And we add to that, accept. The first step is step accept. zero. Right. Because you can't solve a problem you're not willing to have. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> you know, this one, you know, if, you, if your problem isn't really your problem, it's your problem with your problem, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, let me explain what he just said. Um, 
you know, you, you have a friend, not you, but a friend who's been complaining about their job every time you have coffee, or been complaining about their partner, or complaining about, you know, whatever. But they're not doing anything, right? So uh, our thing is like, well, if you're ready to start working on something, you just pick something small. Like, hey, you know, I'd like to have more energy at the end of the week. I always seem to be burned out. Or, um, you know, this work-life balance thing. I don't, I don't have enough time for my kids. Pick something, and then let's work on it. Let's actually prototype some solutions and see what works. Once you start, once you accept, this is my problem. Now I can either decide I'm doing nothing, but I should probably stop complaining because that's not friendly, uh, or I'm going to see if I can, you know, crack it open, move it along, do something with it. So accept is really the first part, and you can't get someone else to accept. That's the thing they do. You can, you can propose, you can, you know, you can suggest. Um, folks, a lot of folks are doing it with, we're thinking maybe the next book is like designing your life together or something, because a lot of couples are doing this. And we didn't, that wasn't, you know, our experience wasn't that in workshops and things. They didn't come as couples. I mean, we do have a tip there. We, I mean, we've heard back from Zoom couples. We've seen groups work together. And so if you're going to do, if you're going to do this stuff, you really want to stick with the methodology, including the mindset. And the mindset of design really is this open-minded, iterative, discovery-based empiricism. Yes, I'm going and. to go do <clears throat> stuff and let the feedback from this fabulous lab called reality speak to me. If I shift into high judgment-oriented criticism right in the middle, it'll screw the whole bloody thing up. So for a classic example, so we do this one sheet, three different versions of the next five years of your life. We call it Odyssey Planning. And so you, know, you and your partner do it. So I do mine, you do yours, and then, you know, Clash of the Titans begins in the negotiation. You know, so no, that's true. So we've now enabled people to fight more effectively. That's not it at all. Um, it's like it's like oh, okay, we're we're going to. In fact, the, one of the key rules in ideation is to defer judgment. If you do design really well, not always, but most of the time, you actually almost never have to go to judgment because the work will become evident itself when you notice things rising up that make sense. You don't actually have to. You don't, you don't have nearly as tough decision making to do. So say, oh, well, you've got these three plans, I've got these three plans, exactly one of them are even compatible or shared. The other two are like, whoa, what's up with that? I didn't even know about that China thing. You know, and then say, okay, the next step is prototype. How could we have, a conver have an experience collectively to go live in the prototype, sneak up on the future possibilities in, in both your ideas and mine with the latent wonderfulness that you know, we got together because there's you and me and there's us. There's this us that's like better than either of us alone, and maybe the us knows something about these ideas and could tell the two of us what us wants to be, and that experience can actually become a discovery vehicle rather than an, a, now a turbocharged fight vehicle. So w use the tools prophylactically, please. <laughs> yeah. Well, and is there, I know both of you are practitioners of your own advice, and I'm curious, is there to hear one thing that's either in one of your odyssey plans or in a, something that you're working on in your own life at this moment? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so what I'm doing is I'm so right now one of the things I'm really designing is I'm really doing mindfulness of process, and so mindfulness of process says neither get ahead of nor behind yourselves. So keep in mind, I'm the guy that dragged his feet on the book for two years. So when we finally write the book, you know, and, and I thought, I mean, who needs another book, right? Um, and even if it's a great book, nobody will know. There are 400,000 books released a year. It will do poorly. Come on, Bill, it's a waste of our time, you know. And I lost that battle, and now it turns out people are buying it in droves. So. Shame on me. The, um, and, and, and then the, the thing is, okay, so what I'm supposed to do is give the book its best possible chance of being heard. You know, if you're going to birth a baby, maybe you want to even feed it, you know. Um, and so I'm spending the next, this year, so this is the year of the book, when I'm completely deferring to, and people say, what are you thinking about what's next, Dave? I have the faintest idea, and I'm not thinking about it at all because I have no idea where the current road we're on is going to go, and I've made one decision, which is I'm just going to do whatever the book tells me to do for a year. You know, I'm going to come talk to you, you know, and talk to you, and what, you know, we'll see, just see where this thing goes. And that is not the way my brain works at all. So it's an immense act of personal discipline. My wife's right there holding me accountable to this. Um, and so that's what I'm currently living into. So it's the discipline of focus. The discipline on that one thing of and completely focused on mindfulness of process. Yeah, and the process, yeah. the process of, you know, we've never been here before. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've never been on stage at the Commonwealth Club. This is really strange. Um, but Dave pointed out, yeah, going, to, you, know, you know, getting to a place where this has a lot of impact on people goes through a date. It looks just like today. Wow. Yeah. Who knew? Here we are. Yeah. Um, th th there's a big thing in the book on, on Hi, practices. Hi, Dr. Oz. How's it going? <laughs> yeah. Th How'd th that happen? Dr. Oz. What a, yeah, what, who, <laughs> that's a waste of time. Um, <laughs> 
sorry. This is this is is this recorded? This is recorded, right? Oh they recorded editing. that, Bill. Um, it's a lovely man. There's a there's a, a chapter in the book on practices because mm-hmm. you you know um, we we think that you're gonna you know when you come up to big decisions you can make the spreadsheet and the pros and cons list and this idea I got an eight point two and this idea I got a seven point six but that's in my opinion has never resulted in a decision. You need to engage your emotional intelligence, your other forms of knowing, right? So there's this whole thing on practices and you want to get some aerobic workout on your practices before it comes time for. The big decision: Do we take the, you know, do we move the kids to China for the big yeah. promotion, or, or not, right? Or do we move mom and dad into the rest home or not? So, so I'm working on practices because that, that's been. Uh, I, I do a gratefulness practice in the morning. I do some other things, but I'm trying to develop. Everybody says you should be more mindful, and so I'm working on that. I got, I got this, I got this app. <laughs> I'm through lesson 10. I should have been through lesson 10 on January 10th, <laughs> but I'm still working on it. We won't beat ourselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. You write a book like this, and your chance to be a hypocrite is really maximized. <laughs> <laughs> what are what are some of the strangest moments you feel like you've been in now that this book is out there and people are are gobbling it up, and you're just like, oh wow, I didn't think that would happen. <laughs> <laughs> what a straight line. Um, the okay. Probably the strangest moment was I'm sitting on a on a on a uh, on an airplane and literally a guy walks up to me and he goes, oh, "Are you are you Dave Evans?" <laughs> you know, and I go, "Yeah," you know, um, and he goes, "Well, well, I just wanted to say hi." You know, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we love the book. I kind of go, "Great, that's just, you know, appreciate the two bucks." No, the, really, um, it was uh, just. <laughs> Absolutely bizarre. And no, and then you ended up you on an airplane. Yeah, yeah and then, then you ended up running office hours for like six people. No, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 that was yeah. actually doing office hours with the stewardess, but that's not yeah. the story. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were you, we were at another event over in Berkeley, and, and my, my wife was there, and, and three young um, uh, women walk up and oh, go, yeah. <laughs> um, "Can we take your picture?" <laughs> and I go, "If you want, yeah, I guess." I go, "Can we get a We're really big fans." I'm like, really? And we go, of what? You of know, what? Yeah, we, <laughs> the book, you know, it's a book. That, so that's fun. Um, and you also, that's once in a while. <laughs> no, that once in a, you know, once in, and when you have a really big audience like this, once in a while, someone kind of unusual comes up and they'll go, I'm doing just what you're doing. I go, really? You're doing design, you're design stuff? Yeah, but I do it with auras. <laughs> and... <laughs> And like chakras or whatever, and I mean, and if that's your thing, that's cool. It's just, I'm like, I don't think that's what I'm doing. No, no, no. We are totally on the same wavelength, and we should get together. I don't together. know how we haven't met. Yes, yeah. And I'm like, okay, you know, uh, my email's on the thing. Send me. An email. Uh, okay. Not to beat this question, but I mean, a really fun anecdote is, I mean, as teachers especially, you know, and, and yeah. we're product guys and marketing guys, there are lots of people, but you know, gainfully unemployed for years and. Um, seeing the light bulb go on for people is really fabulous. So I, I was doing a gig at the Seattle Town Hall. There's a thing like this at the Town Hall of Seattle, the night of the first presidential debate. And I literally went on right after Hillary and Donald had just you know, gone after each other for the first time. I thought, great. Number one, nobody's going to come. And number two, the few people are going to be really grumpy. So this is fabulous. And 300 people showed up, and they weren't grumpy. It's like anything else, you know, it wasn't that hard to compete. Um, and this, uh, and we do the Q and A, which we got to start pretty shortly here. And the one guy read sitting over about there, you know, in the mid fifties, you know, raises his hand, you know, and he, and he goes, and I go, what's the question? He goes, so this prototyping thing. I go, yeah. He goes, you could do that like with anything, <laughs> right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, ah. Oh. <laughs> and a couple more questions. They raise his hand again. I go, yeah. And he goes, and. That's a really big deal, isn't it? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, right. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, and the last time he goes, one more, he goes, and you could do this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I go, yeah. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he got an ovation. You know, for, you know, <laughs> like he the light figured bulb it has out. Gone on. And that's just fabulous. Just fabulous for people. Yeah, like, you know, I could do th- I could do this. See, people say I could do this. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's an example of somebody, you know, if you think back to the variety of people you've helped, mm-hmm. who's somebody who you're particularly proud of? The shift that they made or 
a story of somebody that you were like, oh, this person's well, really stuck, and if we could only help them. You know, I, I, I just love my Boy. students at Stanford. They're just amazing. The undergrads are just amazing people, and they're so smart. And But, you know, they have been wired <coughs> by parents in society mm -hmm. to be just, you know, work so hard to get to Stanford, and then they get there, and they work so hard to, you know, to do something. And it takes, so, it takes some time when you're that age to sort of start listening to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, there's your voice of your mom wants you to do this, your dad wants you to do this, and Uncle Ned thinks you should be a doctor. It goes blah, to blah, Steve blah, blah, Jobs, blah. I mean, all kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, and, 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 and they'll come into office hours, and they have a problem, and we'll start talking, and I'll say, what's up? And they'll, you know, they'll burst into tears or something, and they'll go, okay, so I'm like just process that and tell me what's going on. And it's like, you know, I got into med school, and I don't want to go. They go, okay, you don't have to go. No, you don't understand. My dad's wanted me to be a doctor since I was five. So I understand that. Let's reframe that. Your dad mm -hmm. loves you a lot, wants you to be successful. You don't have to be a doctor. And they're like, really? And I go, yeah. And they go, oh, okay. Well, that's, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and then they're off and they're, and they're so happy, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, so in, in just another minute I do get a two, call and then once in a while from the a, dean. A, a really angry call. parent. Yeah. Or in the just dean. another minute or two, we're going to go to questions or from the, the audience. Yeah. So please start thinking about what you'd like yeah. to ask these two sure. amazing gentlemen here. We'll have people around with mics to take your questions. Um, but if there was one last thing that you feel like it's, it's your favorite part of the process <laughs> to teach. You know, your oh. favorite tip to give to somebody because you feel like it just cracks them open and helps mm. them think of things in a new way. I hate superlatives. They just make me crazy. <laughs> um, you know, I, for a lot of people who take the class, they've never had a design class before. So just, you know, like everybody thinks they know how to brainstorm and stuff, but they, everybody's not very good at it. If you, if, you really, if you really study how brainstorming works, it's like this great jazz ensemble, you know. Um, you know, Dizzy Gillespie's playing something and then, and then all of a sudden, you know, um, somebody plays off of that and somebody plays off of that and Miles Davis comes up with something you've never heard before. So teaching people how to really access their creativity and, and, and brainstorm and, and really when they get in that moment where it's really working and they're like, wow, we just had ideas I never ever had before. Watching that light bulb, that's a really fun time for me. Because, you know, my design students do that all the time, but the other students who come to class, and they come from every, I mean, they come, you know, they could be any, they could be an engineering student or a business student or a, whatever, um, watching them see that they can be creative, that's a really cool time for me. Very nice. My favorite thing probably is um, both the reframe of networking we just did here and, and, and its outcome, which is to have people have a chance to get together with someone and get the story. First, teaching them, no, don't look like you're asking for something you don't deserve, like, hey, just hire me, you're, you know, I'm desperate, you know, please save my life, fix me. You know, that doesn't work at all. <coughs> um, but, you know, really, I think I'd really like to know more about you. What is the audio you really about? Tell me that story. You know, and you really dedicate your life to that. You probably can tell. Everybody has a story. I'm asking them for something they've got. Mm -hmm. And, and people are either scared of it or don't think, you know, what's in it for them. The students just the chance scared. to talk yeah. about their favorite thing in the world. Uh, and over and over and over and over again with people of all ages, um, we get this feedback, like, oh my, you know, I tried that thing and I thought you guys were full of it, but actually the person, they got, we got together and it went for 90 minutes. We had this amazing time, you know, and, the, and it was really great. Um, and, and once people start realizing that the human race is full of mostly <laughs> good people who are trying to do the right thing and would like you to be closer to the path you'd want to be on than you are today, and if there's anything they could do for you. One woman we worked with got a piece of counsel. That, I mean, the kind of one-liner that we often don't say, like, you know, you should ask for 100% of what you want 100% of the time from 100% of the people. And I'm kind of going, like, yeah, well, you know. Oh, um, and, she said, and she started trying it. <laughs> You know, and it was a little out for her. It's that's you know sort of a Tony Robbins kind of thing, and um, <clears throat> not my style. And but nonetheless, she found people amazingly willing to be helpful. So if I, the thing I really love to do is 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 help people recognize that the other people on the planet are probably on their side. Wonderful. And on that point, mm -hmm. yeah. I think we'll use that to transition to questions from the audience. We've got people with the mics upstairs and down. Bless you. Um, I think they'll come around. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we'll, we'll lift the lights. Will we lift the lights so we yep, can so we see, see you? you? 
And so please try to really, truly ask questions. Okay. Okay. Your mic's off. Yeah. It's off. Yes. Yeah. Can't hear it. Can't hear it. Okay. In that Microphone case, we'll on. start over on your okay. right. All right. We'll start there. Hi. Hi. I am curious, what are the one or two things you've done, seen, read, that have made you you, that have really influenced you to make you here today? What? One or two things what you've done made, or read that made you who you are? I'll, I'll She'll give be you a, moderating the next uh, Commonwealth. Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. Give you a, <laughs> I'll give you a book, and, and not that I admire her philosophy at all, no, but yeah. um, The Fountainhead. I read mm. The Fountainhead you know, when I was in this place of trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I just wanted to be him. <laughs> um, and not, not her, not Ayn Rand. Um, she's a little crazy. But um, <laughs> that book, that book really, that mm. book really hit me. And then, um, and then, I, and then, you know, I started mm. studying philosophy and other things, and those were important things mm -hmm. too. But you know, this may sound melodramatic, but the honest answer to the question is is probably I think it, what may have made me the way I am more than anything else is the fact that my father killed himself when I was nine. Um, and we didn't know that that's how he died until we were in our 30s. My, our mom protected us from a, a memory that would be damaging when we were small. Bless her heart for that. But, um, and uh, so it, it just never occurred to me um, that anyone other than me was going to figure this out. So I kind of like skipped adolescence entirely. I noticed all my 12 to 15-year-old friends fighting their parents. I kind of go, they, they have all the money and the power. Why are you doing this? You're going to lose again and again. Um, and, and so it just as, as a kid... Um, I just noticed that, um, you know, the, the traditional role, of, I mean, mom, mom is great, but, but, you know, I just kept, it just occurred to me, I guess I'm going to have to figure this out. Now, I did it really badly. I was immensely ineffective. This would have been so helped by the class we teach had I been there at the, had it been there at the time. But it never occurred to me that I couldn't figure it out. I mean, so, sort, of the, sort of the gift of the stupidity of my nine-year-old self was, well, I guess it's up to me now. And then it didn't occur to me that that wouldn't work. And so the ability to um, have confidence that the world would respond to me and I could figure something out, is, it was very formative early on. Thanks for sharing that. Other Next questions? Come back over on Next this question side. Here on your yeah. Left. yeah. Hi, thanks for being here. I am in the middle of your book and I am in the getting unstuck chapter and I'm mm -hmm. stuck. <laughs> okay. And I think the problem is, um, goes back to the Good Time Journal, where I'm supposed to be keeping track of things that I that give me energy or things that I find um, engaging. Right, mm -hmm. engage during yeah. my day. Yep. And I can't find <coughs> anything because I'm not doing what I want to be doing. Uh -huh. So, how do you counsel people to think differently about when they can't find anything mm. they're engaged by? Yeah. Um, one, one thing would be um, make sure you're thinking about your whole day. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big thing. Like the person at Starbucks was nice to me and gave me, you know, extra foam. Or, <laughs> or you know, um, my I love arguing with Terry Gross because she can't talk back on the radio. Right, right, right. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, right. So I, I, sometimes people are looking for really big, big things, big, big energy, big engagement. Look, look for small things and don't just look at, at, for your job. But one of the things, the reason to journal for a while is to go, wow, I kind of noticed that things aren't, aren't, aren't engaging. So you're not actually stuck. You're starting to develop sort of a database of what's going on for you. And, and just noticing is, is one of the things that positive psych guys say is just noticing what's happening actually changes your, mm -hmm. your um, relationship to it. So now it's a thing you can talk about and it's a thing you can sort of go, look, I had you know, no engagements this week that were um, interesting or life-giving. Life um, and the next week I had two, but they weren't at work. They were about when I was working with my niece and making, you know, birthday cakes or something. So over time, you know, over a little bit of time, a week, a month, mm -hmm. you know, a couple months, you, you'll start to see that there's a pattern to things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd, I'd argue you're not necessarily, not necessarily stuck. You're just, um, you might be in a place where you don't like the data so far. <laughs> well, and you gave but a hint. But that's okay. Because I don't get to do the things I want to do, she said. You already know what gives you some energy. There's just not much of it in your current situation structurally. 
So find ways to actually sneak a little bit of that in and see if you can start, you know, start having the subterfuge of that, you know, or if it's a fundamentally structural problem, then okay, we just accept that, now what do you want to do with it? So if it, you don't need to keep doing the exercise to prove that you already know what you already know. It's not, you know, doing three more weeks of discovering the same thing is not gonna change the data. Should we take a question from sure. upstairs? A, upstairs. Can we do that? A um, higher level question. On your right. <laughs> Hi. 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 Um, what do you advise for people um, who may come to a point in their life, they've designed their life to a certain degree um, and end up breaching their goals on what they need to be now? How do you go about redesigning your life once you hit that peak? So you, you've done a life design and it's working and yeah, you're getting what you want. Bored. You've hit your goals and now and you're you bored. finished early. <laughs> yeah. Take the next decade off. There you go. <laughs> no, that's really boring. That's even more boring. <laughs> that's right. No, very boring. Yeah. 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 Okay. So if it turns, so if you did a, re first of all, congratulations. You did such a good job designing your life. You not only succeeded and engaged it, but you did it with such a level of occupancy of your own mind share that you didn't waste any time thinking about plan B. <laughs> Well, maybe this was planned. That's maybe. a reframe. Okay. So, <laughs> no, that's good. That's, that's good. That's good. I mean, that's you were really fully good. engaged, yeah. and now you're done. Yeah, I'm fulfilled. Um, well, okay, but so. <laughs> and bored now because it's like, okay, what, what next? No, exactly. So, the first question is you don't know. The first thing we notice is you don't know. Mm -mm. You have not curated a new interest yet. And so, the first phase of that's going to be oh, I notice, you know, I was fully occupied, and now I'm not. And so the next thing I need to do is to grow an interest that might be eventually earning yeah. the right to become life organizing. So something, and having had a very successful engagement, the, the bar in your mind is very high. I know exactly what it's like to live really in an engaged, meaningful way. And now I have no idea whatsoever. And the mind is going to resist the heck out. Like, ooh, you don't like this at all. We've been, we, all of us guys that hang out in your brain have been very happy for a long time. And you need to fix this right now. You know, this, this board yeah. undirected thing is not working for any of us in here. Um, so that's, isn't this great? I'm now going to actually have a phase of life where I'm going to be, you know, taking what I often say, every pile has a top. So whatever you might be interested, even though it's not as interesting as the last thing, you pick the best interest you've got and go find out more about those, do some curiosity, do some conversations, do some experiences, and start earning your way forward into some possibilities of things that might start growing a new passion or a new interest in you. But that's gonna take a little while, and that's yeah. a project in and of itself. You know, I'll tell you a story. I, was, uh, I remember the day I, I discovered that I was really bored in my job at Apple. And I had a great job. I was there seven years, it was fantastic. I had a fantastic, you know, I, I, that's when we still had, um, mm -hmm. Well, you, you know, every five years you got a sabbatical and I had my sabbatical and everybody's supposed to quit, but I came back and I wanted, you know, I loved my job. And then after a couple Look, years- Look, I helped launch the invention of a thing called the laptop. That was kind of fun. Yeah, it was really fun. And then there, I remember driving there one day and there's a little thing where you get off of, you know, 84 and you drop down into Infinite Way and it was a sunny day and I got out of the car and I said, I'm done with this. This isn't interesting anymore. Um, so that, that's, you know, that's one realization. Then what do you do with it? Well, it took me about a year to figure out, one, how to promote everybody that was working for me so they all had my job, <laughs> so that when I left they were all okay, and then two, to figure out what I wanted to do next. But it just started, that, that, the moment of realizing, okay, I'm, done with, I'm essentially done with this, doesn't mean you get to just walk away, you, you, know, you have responsibilities probably, but, but it's where you start getting curious about what's next. And I didn't know, you know, I talked to lots of people, met a bunch of friends, mm -hmm. some guys were starting a consulting firm, I'd never done mm -hmm. consulting, you know, th one thing led to another, and that was the next 10 year chapters in my life. And then, and then this David Kelly guy called mm -hmm. me and said, you wanna, you wanna teach? Thanks. So, I mean, I get bored with things about every 10 years, <laughs> and I look for, mm -hmm. gotta get something new, and I think, I think people who are like, like you that are, mm -hmm. you know, energetic and smart and want to mm -hmm. want to accomplish stuff at some point the, with the thing you're doing either you stop learning or 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 it changes and it's not interesting anymore um or you just want to try something new and there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that i think the world is more configured now for us to change careers and mm -hmm. try new things than it's ever been yeah. nobody says oh you've mm -hmm. only been at that job 10 years what are you flaky you know it's like 
<laughs> Nowadays, if you go, you've been at that job 10 years. What's what wrong are you? with you? You haven't done a startup yet? Yeah. yeah. What, you know, like, what's the matter with you? Well, I right? think one so, of the nicest yeah. concepts in your book is the idea that people have multiple lives. Yeah, you absolutely. And that yeah. the idea that you have just one life is ridiculous. There's more than one of you in there. You're not going to get to all of them by any means whatsoever. Yeah. And the big changes, by the way, the other thing is there's so many clarities and Google everything, and I should know, I should be clear all the time and motivated all the time and cheerful all the time. How's it going? Great. It's going great. You know? <laughs> I'm Let's completely confused and having a blast doing that. You know? um, <laughs> We're going to move on to just a couple more. Right. Okay. So we'll take a question over here. Go right ahead. This side. I think we're on the right, actually. Hi, to your right. Hi. I'm curious, when you went through the process of writing, your engagement meter, joy meter, gratitude, when was it the highest? When we hired the collaborative writer. <laughs> <laughs> Zing! Was that I the have same a helper who will make you, me Bill? finish the book. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, I, I had an opportunity to fin. We had to turn the uh, we had to turn the manuscript in by August fourth, uh, two thousand fourteen, and I had an opportunity to spend ten days in Paris by myself finishing my chapters, and that was astonishingly wonderful. Yeah. I've always wanted to go to Paris and write a book. So you got the. <laughs> I was kind of thinking, that's when you bought the fedora, right? Yeah, I was kind of thinking it would be more like maybe, you know, Hemingway or Fitzgerald or something. But this was okay. This was a pretty good experience. <laughs> so it was I, really great. I know we've got time for two more questions. So we'll come on over would here. Would you like some thank more espresso? No, no, I'm working on my manuscript. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Back here on your left. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, so my question is, it seems like when you've defined the problem really well, sometimes the solutions will just come out more easily. Like you'll find yeah. the right solutions when the yeah. problem is defined really well. Yep. What are some signs that you've defined the problem sufficiently well? When you think when you can think of five prototypes you want to try right away. Right? When when you're like, okay, I've, I've, I I I thought it was this, but now I really really realize it's this. This is the thing that's interesting. Oh, and if that's interesting, I could try this and this and this and this. As soon as the energy starts to pull you into prototyping, you know you've, you've hit kind of a core issue for you. And, um, and you'll, you'll know it. I mean, you totally feel it. Um, a lot of times people say, oh, I've got the problem, and it's actually just a solution. Oh, you know, what I need is a better job. or I, I need, need to a, be a vice president. I need to be a vice president. Or I, need, I need a better boss. And it's like, that's just the solution. What's the problem? What's, what's, causing, you know, what's causing this issue? But once you get to that, man, it, it, uh, my experience is you just you can think of five things you want to try right away. OK, we'll take one more one question more. from the upstairs. Upstairs on your right. All right, you guys um, mentioned at the very beginning that you know, our current political situation is causing a little bit of angst. How would you apply design thinking to, I guess this is kind of meta, but uh, design our could social Could Trump actually ecosystem. design think? That's really the question. Yeah, can you? Um. Or how would you do it? Um, you know, I, I, I think I liked what Dave said before. It's um, we could spend we we're spending a lot of time right now arguing about stuff um, ideologically. And, and, and uh, okay, I mean, and if if you feel that that's where your energy is to make those arguments, then that's fine. But I think what we have to do is do stuff. I think I think you know I think the catharsis of a bunch of people showing up at the San Francisco, some showing up at the San Francisco airport because they don't like this travel ban thing was just a moment when people said, "I got to do something." Um, I think we still have to have civil conversations. We still have to be, you know, kind to each other. But um, I think I I think it's a perfect time for design thinking. Like, what's the real problem here? What did we miss? To whatever side of the equation you're on, we you missed something. Because something happened and nobody was expecting it. So what did we miss? What, what can we do that would, would get us curious about what's going on? And then let's, let's prototype something and see if, see if we can get um, some energy going around it. The, the advantage design thinking has in that context is it's, it's user-centered. It's human-centered design. It's about the human we're trying to serve with this thing, this idea, this process, this product, this whatever it is, this life design methodology that we're trying to build to serve this human being. 
And so if we actually could get people into what they thought was a design project of some kind, then you can't have a design project without a user. And the common ground we all start with is who's the user, empathy thing one, what's going on with this person or this group of people. And then now if we help? really get them thoroughly enough, then the next step is defined, which is now I have a point of view about what we could actually do. And usually the, the image of that, that definition is, um, is an imaginal possibility of a future for that person or that group of people. And that, that comes, you, if we have to have the same ideological stance, you can't get there from here. So, so a thinking, you know, analytic approach to, to compromise doesn't work. Uh, we can't not help this person does work. You know, and, that we, and then you can actually get somewhere. Well, I love the idea that if there's anything harder than designing your life, it's the political situation. Designing, so we can just yeah. get curious, talk to people, yeah. Yeah. and try I'm, stuff. Yeah. I mean, we've, yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're going to have this, this studio for 14 or 16 different universities, and Gabrielle, who is on our team, is sitting right here. And so we, uh, we completely blew the staff meeting one day, and we were supposed to ideate how to do this thing. And she instantaneously comes up with a five-minute exercise or seven-minute exercise, and seven people all just go to the wall and draw your four-day curriculum for these 50 people to come learn how to do this thing. Just go. You've got five minutes to do it. So seven versions of a four-day curriculum are just whiteboarded. Bam, 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 bam. No conversation. Each, every one of them has a completely different pedagogical, architectural you know, point of view and could be argued deeply by PhDs for long periods of time and be right or wrong. And then we just stand back and we, everybody just silently reads all seven of them. And we go, oh, this is about that and this is about that and this one we should add. And they just, the answer, as you were just saying, sort of came out of the reality of working on what are these 50 people going to do for four days? Yeah. You know, so if you work on the problem, not on just your point of view about the problem, you can actually get somewhere. All right. So last question. I get it. Um, part of the informed mm. tradition. It's a, it's a really easy question. <laughs> In 60 seconds, <laughs> I would like to hear from each of you about your idea to change the world. You go first go. Or last. Okay. <laughs> I know. I know. This is just going to sound like we're we're just trying to stay on message. But my idea to change the world is that if we were all really curious about each other, um, we would we would understand why some people you know think we shouldn't have health care and some people think we should. If we were really curious about each other, we would um, and and we put the kind of user first instead of my argument then we could find some common ground to work on things. You know, for, for me, like, the, we've decided at, at the School of Engineering there are 10 big problems. Energy, uh, climate, you know, the new urban cities, things like that. And our new program, we're going to work on energy and healthcare. Because if we don't have energy, we, we can't run the society. And, and, if we aren't, and if we don't have health and wellness, you know, we, then, then the whole thing falls apart. But... Um, we don't know what we're going to do about those things. We just want to know we want to have impact. And so the, we're going to start by just talking to people about what they need um, and trying to understand how to put systems together that they need. I think if we were all that curious about what's going on in the world, rather than starting from um, judgment first, we could find more common ground and we can solve big problems. True. Um, and everybody's, everybody's got something that they could do. Mm -hmm. Everybody is creative. Everybody's got something they could do. Just pick the thing and get started. Yeah. Thank you. And Dave, what about you? I'm going to make the world a better place. So I'm actually going to rip off another guy's idea. And it'll, it, this is going to sound like we've been working together too long because it's surprisingly complimentary. The, um, so um, Brian Stevenson, Equal Justice Initiative. Um, really great guy, doing amazing work. And he has four moves you ought to make if you actually want to make a difference in society. And one of them I would call... Um, uh, disc uncomfortable withnessing. So everybody needs to go out and have a withnessing experience. And what he argues is don't don't start by trying to figure out what the solution of the problem is. That's too hard. You know, and you don't know when you don't have no idea what you're doing. Uh, and so go out and so figure out the problem that is upsetting you. And go be with the people in the problem. Be with it. And and it's going to make you uncomfortable. Uh, and don't solve it, don't fix it, don't bring your educated superiority, shut the hell up and just go be with us in some kind of a rational way and allow yourself to humbly be educated by the reality of a part of the world that you don't really fully understand. Um, you know, you know the, the, the South American liberation theologians would argue that if you want to hear the voice of God, you have to speak to the poor, the widow, the oppressed, because there's a special voice there you must listen to. So there's a voice in the place that's on your mind and go hear it by being with it. If you, be, if you just be with the problem, 
skip the solution and wait, things will get clearer. Wonderful. So I think we'll, we'll end on that note of curiosity, empathy, witnessing, and thank you very much, both of you, for coming thank and you. joining us tonight. Um, if we'll, we'll have everyone <laughs> stay in their seats for just a moment longer, I believe Marissa's gonna come back on stage and talk about the book signing, so. Thank you guys, what we're going to do, I'm actually gonna let these guys take a break for a second. And what we're gonna do is if you already have your book and you would like to get your book signed, stay still. <laughs> if you need a book, uh, go out on out to the lobby, pick it up if you already bought it or purchase it and then come back in and sit in the center as close to front as there